Good morning, LSA, and welcome to church. Today is Father's Day, and we want to encourage everyone to stay after the service for a barbecue. To help offset the costs, we are charging $1 per item. So stick around and have some fun with us while we eat some good food. And speaking of good food, we have a kids and youth family barbecue coming up on June 29th. There will be food, activities, a bouncing castle, and a movie starting at dusk. Talk to Susan or Megan if you need more information. Also, don't forget that registration for our kids camp is live and filling up fast. You can go to our website and register today. Prime time is next Wednesday and the last one until September. Make sure you come out and join us for a great time of fellowship and bring a friend. For those of you that attended our annual general meeting last Monday, we talked about our budget and that we are making some cuts. One of those cuts is our Right Now Media subscription. At the end of this month, we will no longer be able to access those resources. So, if your community group uses it currently, please reach out to Deb Toth and she can help you out with new content. If you have any questions, you can visit our website at lsa.church. And now, let's continue with our morning service.
Good morning. And especially to all the fathers in the room, here in this room and online, congratulations on your day. <laughs> we are so thankful for you. Uh, you're awesome. You make life better. And I hope you feel really celebrated and special today. So join us in the rest of this worship, and let's have a great time together. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never, never alone. You're a good, good, good father.
forget the moms, them too. <laughs> Bless those fathers to know how to guide their children, to be stronger in doing so, to understand your willingness. Give them the right words by your Holy Spirit to guide their families and lead in worship, in spiritual well-being, in kindness. And Lord, we ask that you would please heal the bikers. Let them be safe as they come, as they're here, as they go back on their way, especially on this treacherous road we have here. Lord, bless that road to be safe today for all, and let, let that offering be multiplied 
as the offering is taken up today. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Stories. Everyone has one. They are passed down from generation to generation. We've all listened to a funny story, a sad one, a happy one, or stories that make us mad. We've listened to stories about people we know, or a story about someone we've lost. Stories are something that bring people together. They connect us as we reminisce about our past or look forward to the future. The Bible is a collection of stories, and in those are sections that we know as Bible stories, which tell the events of some of the most amazing people who have ever existed. But what if they are more than just stories? Good morning. Welcome uh, to everyone to this Father's Day service, uh, this uh, service where we celebrate and remember uh, the fathers. Now, some people today have their fathers with them. Some are, have only a memory of a father, but we all have them. We all celebrate um, the place that they have uh, had in our lives. To you fathers out there, I want to thank you so much for coming to be here today because what you're doing is radical. It's radical being here in church on a Sunday morning because as a father, you're being a little different than the rest of the world. We know that there is a, a real problem in the world right now with absent fathers, fathers that aren't there uh, for their children. And this is causing a lot of the struggles that we see in our society. A lot of the challenges we see is because dads aren't there. So for you dads who are making this commitment to be here, be with your family online, this is something that you're doing that is going to change your family, your children, your children's children, your children's children's children. This has that kind of power. So thank you for being here today. Our sermon uh, title for this morning, the character we're looking at is Noah, and the title of the sermon is Leading in Hard Times. So I'm looking directly at fathers and saying, hey guys, you guys are to be leaders, and we want to talk about how you're going to lead in hard times. We're living in hard times. So this is going to be uh, completely relevant for us today. Um, we're looking at uh, the uh, book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 6. We're looking at verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 to 22. Let's read it now. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make homes in it, and coat it with, uh, make rooms in it, sorry, and, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in it on the side of the ark and make it, uh, make it lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of every living creature, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and, and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. The word of the Lord. Let, let us take a moment and pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word to us, for this example of Noah, who has led his family through hard times. Lord, we just pray that you would guide us now, that you would be with fathers. Help us to receive this message. Help us to be moved by it. Help us to be transformed, that we could go out in this coming year and continue to live as fathers that emulate and look to you as father and try to emulate that. You're the perfect father, God, and we want to live we just want to live with a little bit of what you have that we can pass it on to our kids. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I've noticed in our society today is that uh, the age that men become dads is changing, right? Back in the 50s and 60s, people became dads like, you know, in their 20s, right? That was the normal time you would have your first child. But in our day, men are becoming dads in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And I think there's even some out there in their 50s that are becoming dads, right? And maybe they're, they're first dad, they're, the first time they're a dad. Now, I can somewhat commiserate with both groups. Um, I, have, I became a dad at 26, and then I had our last child at 39. So I've got that nice spread. I could understand those uh, differences, the differences between being a young dad and an old dad. Uh, so some of those differences. For when I was a young dad, one of the things I loved to do, first child, what do you do? You're a daredevil. You're throwing the kids up in the air. They're twisting around. You're, you're tossing all sorts of directions, right? It's, it's like a fun toy. You're, you're playing with your child. You love it, right? Now as an older dad, I, I, have to, I have to get aside, I have to stretch a little bit, I have to squat down before Sophie and Evelyn are gonna come run to me. I squat, you know, keep the back straight, bend the knees, lift properly, because the last thing I wanna do is throw my back out. As a young dad, I was thinking about getting my first mortgage. That was, I wanted to get a house. That's, that's what I was focused on. I wanted to get a house that my kids could grow up in. Now as an old dad, I'm, I'm trying to calculate how many years before I can downsize, right? I'm starting to say, look, cutting the lawn and having a nice big lawn was great when I was in my 20s. Now I don't like it. I'm thinking, how can I get it as small as possible or get some of that AstroTurf lawn that people are getting and, and put that out? As an old dad, or as a young dad, I was working overtime. I wanted to put in as much time as I could. I wanted to put in all those hours because you want the promotion because you're trying to make your way up. The organization, as an old dad, I'm trying to balance my life. It feels like it's impossible to balance my life, but I'm trying to balance my life at work and, and at home with my family, because what do you realize as an old dad? As an old dad, you start realizing these years are precious, and I only have a few of them. I don't think we see that as young dads. As young dads, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're driven uh, to accomplish but then we start realizing we only have a little bit of time with them. And so we start trying to balance that. But Noah takes being an old dad to a whole other level. Genesis chapter 5 verse 32 tells us that he's like 500 years old when he becomes a dad for the first time. Now there's lots of theories out there about how people could get to the age of 500 years and one day we're going to talk about that but the miracle i want to talk about this morning is that after 500 years he wanted to become a dad he wanted to have kids can you imagine how that would mess up your vibe at home you've been a single guy for 500 years you've kind of got things the way you like them and all of a sudden you're going to throw three boys into that Tell me, guys, can you imagine, imagine, you guys that are in your 60s and 70s, can you imagine now having three baby boys, three toddler boys all running around? The guys that are like in their 20s going, I got three boys, and I can't handle it. Uh, even now, right, it's, it's tough, especially if they're active boys. Even if he had superstar genetics, at some point, he's going to be asking himself, what have I got myself into, right? I'm too old for this. But just like any dad, while some days were hard, he would have also had days where he was just so thankful for these children that God had given him. In the passage we're going to be looking at this morning, it says right in verse 9, this is going to be an account of Noah and his family. So while Noah is primary, the primary person in the story, 
This is more than just about Noah. This is about Noah and his kids and his wife. Just like if someone were to ask you, dads, to tell your story, you couldn't tell your story without talking about your family. They have such a big impact on our lives. Noah, we're going to see, is going to have to lead his family through some very hard, very challenging times. They'll be hard because the world around him is falling apart. It's corrupt. And he's trying to lead his family during this time to follow God, to love, to love God. What an important message for us today, where we see our society kind of falling apart. What I want to give you this morning, what I'm hoping that you'll leave with this morning as a father or a grandfather, is that you're going to, lead, or you're going to leave with some knowledge about how to lead your family in a godly way while living in an immoral world. So let's begin by looking at Noah. Noah and his day. Verses 9 to 12. Here's an important truth. Children copy what they see adults do. Children copy what adults say. I've learned through experience the scariest words out of my child's mouth when talking to another adult is, my dad says, and that flash of moment, it's usually Abigail who has done this to me in, in my past. She always likes to quote what I say to other people. And in those uh, in that moment, that flash of moment, I start thinking back over the last two weeks and the things that I've said to her, or the things I've said around her, and I've, I try to make a decision. Should I run in, grab her, and make up some reason why I'm whisking her away, or should I just grin and bear it and hope for the best? Well, the great thing about Noah is that he wasn't maybe quite like me. He was, he was a great example for, uh, for his kids and probably never said anything untoward. It says that Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a righteous man. Now, the, world, the word righteous sounds spiritual, I know. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't meant in a super spiritual way. It was actually not understood that way in the Old Testament. Rather, righteousness was a fairly common word that simply meant somebody who kept the moral law, who did, who did good and was innocent of doing bad, of wrongdoing. A righteous man would have avoided sin. A righteous man would have tried to do good to his neighbors, like many of us. You could actually translate the term, instead of righteous, as just translated as good. He was a good man. At a minimum, dads, at a minimum, fathers, we are going to have to be good people for our children. It's going to mean that we're not going to, the baseline is going to be that we're going to have to have um, a good direction in our lives and we're going to have to be good people in our society, good citizens. We're, not, we're going to have to avoid the addictions. I think the, the, the scourge of today, the addiction of today is pornography. We have to do everything we can, not even short of throwing that cell phone out the window if needed at 100 miles an hour driving down some highway somewhere. Um, we have to avoid um, the addictions of alcohol. We have to avoid all sorts of these major pitfalls that are going to impact our family life. So that's rock bottom. If we're going to lead our families well, we have to be good people. It's, it's no good. Here's, here's the truth. It's no good telling your teenagers that they shouldn't act in a certain way if you're acting in that way yourself. One thing we know from teenagers is that they can smell hypocrisy miles away, right? If we're asking them to do something, they're going to call us out on it if we're doing that thing ourselves. But here's the thing. I think we should even go further than just being good. So good is the baseline. What's the goal? The goal is uh, we should provide a more robust example, more robust than a, ra a righteous one. We should attempt to be blameless as Noah was. Now, Noah, uh, the, the word blameless is not like righteousness. Righteousness is all over the Old Testament. But blameless isn't used quite so often, very rarely for people. 
blameless was usually used for um, an animal sacrifice. Remember, they would talk about a pure, uh, this lamb that was spotless, right? It would, another word they might use is blameless. It was a blameless animal. It was clean. It was spotless. When it's referring to a person, it means that they have a great relationship with God, that they have a close relationship with God. The Hebrew word translated blameless is tamim. You can see it up there. I, I've, I've decided I'm always going to put the Hebrew um, uh, lettering up there as well, because I want you to see it. We always have to remember that the Bible we're reading is a translation from two different languages, Hebrew and Greek. And so I'm always going to try to put those up so you can see it. What it means here, tamim, is spiritually whole or complete. We cannot become whole or complete, though, on our own through simply hard work. The only way to be blameless is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, because what he does, he takes our brokenness. Has anybody, uh, any men here been broken? Have any men here made mistakes that you regret to this day that if you thought about it for a second, we all have. We all have. We've got things in our brain, you can, you can, in a flash of a second, you can go back and go, man, I regret that. You've got things that you've done, you've said, bad decisions you've made, and here's the thing, when we go to Jesus, no matter what we've done, he takes it and he purifies it. He makes us blameless. Isn't that beautiful? Today, this morning, you can be blameless before God because he purifies it. He takes what you've done and purifies it. Then, through that saving relationship with Jesus, not only have we become blameless, but we are able to now strive for the good and avoid the bad because along with the relationship with Jesus, we get the Holy Spirit. So we go in, we go in, we have this relationship, we become blameless, then he gives us the Spirit so we can now live out a holy life. So in other words, it's not enough to just come to church, although that's a really good thing. It's a good start. Um, it's not enough to just read our Bible. Now, reading our Bible is really important, but it's not enough. What we have, we, we require is a personal relationship with Jesus that we have on a daily basis, that we're engaging with him. That might mean through prayer. It might mean just having, taking a moment in your day and just remembering that Jesus is there close to you and with you. And then he changes, uh, then he changes uh, all that. In other words, it's not enough to just come to him. He changes us through this relationship. He transforms us. And as he transforms us, we become a good example for our children, for our families to follow. In a sense, we become, our dads are called to become conduits of godliness, of God's grace to our children. Paul says in the ESV translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul knew that being a good example was very important, that it could help other people follow Jesus that maybe didn't really know him really well yet and didn't know how to follow him. They could follow Paul as Paul followed Christ. In the same way, dads, your children can follow you as you follow Christ. In such a time as the ones we're living in today, we need fathers, we need dads who are going to be what? Standard bearers. In an army in the old days, a standard bearer was one who carried the flag, right? The, I'm not sure you'd ever want to be that guy, right? You're the one carrying the flag that everybody can see. That's the person, the person carrying that is, these are the colors. These are the things that the other enemy wanted to get. They wanted to take them. It was an insult if you could take somebody else's uh, standard. So you got, so dads, you're the standard bearer. You're the one walking through this life, carrying this flag that your children can rally around. That when everything else is going terrible, they know, where's dad? Because dad's the guy that I can follow. I can trust him. If he says this is the way we should go, he's the guy I'm following because I've watched him follow Christ throughout his life. That's our example. It's what we're looking to do. They can know by following us, they're following biblical values, and we are holding those biblical values. Here's the challenge, guys. We have to hold our biblical values 
with what? With firmness, but also grace and compassion. The hardest things as dads is to not get pulled off into one direction or the other. Don't become a legalist and don't become wishy-washy. Stand in the middle, stand strong with biblical values, but always do it with grace and compassion. And the reason we do that is because we don't need to judge the world. We don't need to judge the world. God never calls us to judge the world because we're not the final judge. God is. All we need to do is be faithful. And what we see in the text is, is that God in the future will judge the earth. He, in fact, in this story, God judges those who do evil, verses 13 and 17. Now, before we talk about God judging those who do evil, we have to remember, first off, we were once those evil people. We were those ones doing evil. We were involved in all sorts of stuff that we shouldn't have. We were living by worldly standards, and we loved it. It was great. It was a great time. We, we loved being involved in that. We were living in our sin. So while it's true that God judges those who do evil, we remember we were once those, and that we now stand as living examples of those who have been given grace, those who have been given forgiveness. We stand as an example to those that are still in sin, that there is a way out of it, and that way out of it is a new life in Jesus Christ. So what we're witnessing here in verses 13 and 17, it's not a repentant group of people, and this is the issue here. It's not a repentant group of people who were just completely, they were instead, in fact, completely unrepentant. They were fully engaged in their sin, and they did their sin without ceasing. They would not stop no matter what was said to them, no matter what was taught. They were living out this sin, not just once a day, uh, once, a, once a week, once a year. This was a daily basis they stood in complete and full and conscious opposition to the will of God. They had what is called hard hearts. As a result, God says he's going to put an end to all people. All the people who were living, uh, were not living like Noah and his family, he says he's going to destroy them. In verse 17, God reveals the judgment he's going to unleash on the earth. It's going to be floodwaters. The floodwaters will not destroy all all life, obviously. What life will not be destroyed when the flood comes? Fish. Fish are going to be like, this is the greatest day ever. What is going on? I can go anywhere I want all around the world. There is no shore anymore. Everything is a place that I can go. So not all life on earth is going to die when the floods come. What we're going to see is that some are going to die, the ones that are on earth. He's going to destroy those that are on earth, that is, that, that have that breath of life in them. In a similar way, we know that God is going to bring judgment once again to earth. But the de- next judgment isn't an intermediate one. So the flood is an intermediate judgment. That is, it's a judgment, but some people stay alive and then continue to keep living out on the earth. Some animals continue to live and uh, continue on on earth after. But the judgment that comes next, the one that we're looking, uh, that is coming in our future someday, is where God is going to come and he's going to judge the earth, but then he's going to recreate it. He's going to recreate the heavens and the earth, and he's going to uh, recreate, give new bodies, resurrected bodies to Christians. What we see in the intermediate judgment, though, is a flood that God gives Noah, where God gives Noah a way to protect his family. Verses 14 to 16. I know as a dad, I am concerned about the world that my children live in. I'm concerned about the, what the world is communicating to my children, especially online. I think we're all concerned about that. It's not that I don't trust my kids, but I know how devious and sneaky the world can be. It's got into my own heart at times, right? It's got in and, and kind of given alternate messages and I find myself following them. So I don't, want, I don't want my kids to get that. I don't want my kids to have this stuff in their head and, and in their hearts and causing all sorts of problems. The way they get into kids' minds and lives today, the way the world gets in and messes with their hearts is through the cell phone. 
The cell phone is always with them, right? It's a way, uh, even at night, you know, up in a bedroom, um, while they're trying to fall asleep, you know, they have this device where the world has a direct line into their world. And the way they get in is, is through these cell phones, and that's why my young teenagers, to their, their great shame and chagrin, do not have a cell phone. The rule in our household, and this is a great one, and I would suggest this to all people. This is a great rule. You can't have a cell phone till you have a job where you can pay for half of the plan. It also keeps the plan really cheap. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, I have to pay for half of that? Okay, I, I need to, I, well, cheapest plan, talks and text, that's it. That's all I want. And this is a good plan, right? Because what, it, what it's doing is encouraging them to take responsibility, to be able to, to get that. It also, if they don't want to work, extends how long before they end up having one. Now, this causes all sorts of problems, right? Because when the kids go to school now, everything the teachers do, they're always using the cell phone as their access to the kids. And so this is a, tra a challenge. Now, there's lots of other ways you can do this, uh, obviously through uh, all sorts of um, ways of parental controls. This is just one way that we have found uh, keeps things really easy. In Noah's day, God gives Noah a way to protect his family, kind of like what I'm doing with my family, like you do with yours. He's giving a way to protect uh, Noah's family. He's giving them a rescue plan. God's plan from the world's perspective is far crazier than not giving a teenager a cell phone. God tells them to build an ark. He tells them to build an ark. Now the word, I always thought the word ark meant boat, but ark does not mean boat. Does anybody uh, remember um, Indiana Jones? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, that kind of stuff. The ark of the covenant right? What is the ark? The ark is a box that contains things, godly things. The ark is a box that contains godly things. Now, um, this ark is a lot bigger than the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant could be hid away in some tents, right? So nobody would even know if you walked into uh, wherever the Israelites were, you walked in, you wouldn't even know the Ark of the Covenant existed. But this Ark, every single person in Noah's house, uh, community is going to know about the crazy guy building the Ark. He's gonna, when he starts building this, every, other nations are going to be making fun of him because of what he's doing. Notice its size. It's 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. A cubit is an ancient a form of measurement. It's about 18 inches. Uh, a cubit is about 18 inches. So this makes this a huge box, right? 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet deep. Here's a recreation of the Ark. If you wanted to go see it in Kentucky, uh, it's a it's a goodly size. It's a, it's a very, very big boat. If everyone wants to go down to Kentucky driving through, that might be a cool thing to go see. So everybody would have been aware of what Noah was doing and would have called him crazy. But here is the thing. Sometimes following God, sometimes protecting your family is going to mean people are going to call you crazy. They're going to call you nuts. You're going to look weird to those people around you. Think about praying before a meal at a restaurant. You go to a restaurant, and you're going to pray. And you pray at the restaurant, and it is a form of protection. It's a kind of a form of accountability and protection all at once. It's telling your children, when you decide as a dad to, stand, to sit at that head of that table at that restaurant, and you pray for your family and for the food, what you're doing is you're saying to your children, I'm no different when I leave the home as when I'm in the home. I'm a Christian in both places. And you're also allowing the, them to go, okay, it is okay to be a Christian in the world. It's okay. My dad does it. My dad prays for us. So this is good. Yeah, at the same time, you're going to have people just down on the other table or the waitress that comes back, and they're going to look at you praying, and they're going to think you're crazy because they don't have the faith that you have. Furthermore, notice that Noah having the protection of God still requires effort on Noah's part. It would have taken a long time to build the ark, right? He would have had banged up fingers, banged up thumbs, banged up shins. He would have a cut, a hands uh, would have been cut. Investing in protecting your family costs something. 
It requires something from you. You have to invest yourself. God could command you to do it. God can support you in doing it, but you still need to do it. If we're going to protect our families, it's going to take time. It's going to take energy. It's going to mean taking time to read the Bible to our kids. It's going to mean taking time out of our day to have spiritual conversations with them. It means setting aside time to be at church and to study the Word. And that's exactly what God asks of Noah. He says, you have my word. Now what I want you to do is trust my word. God calls Noah to trust his word. Verses 18 to 22. Last week, we talked about this interesting word, covenant. A covenant is a divine promise that usually obligates God to certain actions and believers to a certain response. In this passage, though, a covenant is something that God does this covenant is God without requiring anything really of human beings. Notice that he will establish the covenant, meaning that the divine obligations are what's in view here. He's not thinking about, okay, what you're going to do in response to me, but rather he's thinking, this is what I'm going to do full stop. I'm going to establish this covenant. And notice he's going to establish it. He's not establishing it. He will establish it in a future time. In essence, then, what he's doing is he's telling Noah, you have to get ready, you have to, right now, you have to trust me for the future. You have to trust that I will establish a covenant with you. You have to follow my command, not knowing for sure what the future is going to ha- hold. But that meant that Noah had to trust God. Then doing what he's called to do, he will receive a covenant with God after the flood, after the judgment. He has to trust God that he will be um, proved right to all those people, those naysayers. And what we know, uh, and we know that a covenant was established, we read it later in Genesis, right? There was a covenant that was established that he would never kill all the rest of humanity. And what did he uh, set as a sign of that covenant? What was the, set, what was the sign? Rainbow, right. Now, <laughs> I gotta admit, sometimes I have such a juvenile way of looking at the Bible. Sometimes I look at it, I, I can't believe I even thought that. For the longest time, probably up to like this week, I kept thinking that God, he was trying to say that he made the rainbow, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because rainbows happen because of rain and, and, and because of the refraction of light. I was like, oh, I get it now. The rainbow had always been there. All he was doing is saying, whenever you see this, I'm going to set that. That thing is a sign. He could have done anything. He could have picked anything and said, that thing, that thing's a sign that you, whenever you see that, remember that I've made a covenant with you. That's all he's doing. He wasn't making it happen that day. He was just saying, that thing will be a reminder to you. So then, uh, Noah was supposed to, and his family are supposed to follow God through this indeterminate amount of time. They didn't know exactly to the second when this flood would start. They just knew that judgment was coming and they needed to follow him. During that time, they simply had to, again, just continue on in the line they had. They didn't have to be perfect because God's grace was covering them, but they had to follow him. Look at verse 22, the last verse. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. This is before the flood. This is before the judgment, and he and his family Follow God. Friends, fathers, it's the same way with us this morning. We all want to protect our families in these difficult times, in these times where the world opposes Jesus Christ and opposes biblical values, basic morality even. We live in corrupt times that requires to invest in our to invest ourselves into making sure that our families float above the cultural world, above that culture, the cultural degradation. We have to be making sure that our children and our families can float above the storm of judgment that is just around the corner. And here's what the Bible tells us. Jesus could return any day. He could return any day to inaugurate the final judgment. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 that in the days leading up to the flood, to judgment, people were just doing their normal things. They were getting married. 
People were dying. All sorts of stuff was going on. People were going to work. They were just doing the normal things. They were acting as if nothing bad could ever happen. No judgment would ever come. And so when it happened, Jesus came, or the flood came, and they, can, they were found in their corrupt ways. But then the flood came, and because they were unprepared, they died. We don't want to be like that. We want to be prepared for when the Son of God returns. And thank God he has given us an ark that we can enter this day. And that ark is a personal relationship with Jesus. If we have a personal relationship with Jesus, then we will be saved from judgment. To protect our children from a future judgment, you need to lead them into a personal relationship with Jesus, doing it yourself, and then encouraging them to follow you and to accept Jesus as well. Because this not only protects them today, but will save them for eternity with God. This morning, we are going to have two elders during the hymn. So we're going to have a special number we're going to play first, and then we're going to have a hymn that's going to be played. The elders are going to come forward. If you would like to pray for your family, this is for dads and moms, this is for everybody. You maybe would like to uh, come forward and have this, this prayer of protection. And I just pray that you would come up and that you would give your life. Maybe you haven't entered the ark yourself. Maybe you haven't entered the ark that is Jesus Christ. And you want to come up and give your life to him. That time will be a time for you to pray for that as well. But again, guys, our children need our prayers. And so if you want to come forward, we are more than ready and happy to pray with you and to pray for your children. Amen. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift.
thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best art, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son. that are still praying to continue to keep praying. This week's challenge is to protect your family like Noah by leading them into the ark, the ark that is Jesus. Amen.